Hello, everyone, and welcome back one last time to Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. This is actually our penultimate show now, but this is the last time that we'll be talking about a movie on this podcast. It's been an amazing run that Jacqueline announced on our last episode where we covered Teen Witch and then dropped the bombshell that, uh, okay, we got one more, but man, what a way to go out and what a guest to have with us. We have esteemed uh, screenwriter, podcaster, critic, Brandon Collins from uh, Medium Popcorn, from Black Drunk History. You and I hit it off. We, I think that we worked together like like 35, 40, 80 years ago. And <laughs> yeah. then we rekindled during, we were doing Doug Loves Movies yes, together yeah, live. And yeah. we're like, I think I know you. Yep. And we just hit it off and we've been trying to get this done ever since. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, we both lost that one too. I'm very competitive with Doug Loves <laughs> Movies. I want to beat Mark. And then we both lost. I'm like, well, that's ironic. Were you on the same episode with Dan, too? Uh, Jack and Coley here, as always. Um, Sorry. I've been <laughs> on with Dan, but I don't think that one was with Dan. Okay. No, that was with Paige. Um, I'm blanking on her oh, name. Right. And Matt Walsh. From Criminal Minds. Oh, yeah, that wow. was the last. That, that was the live show. And then we did a few virtual ones, I think. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. It's a it's a fun show and yeah. and and his show's been running for a, over time. a decade now. Yeah, but we've had a pretty good jog here, Jacqueline. Yeah, we had a good one. Four years, I I would say that's a great r- mile worth it. But I just know that I've seen you do that podcast, and I think yeah. it was with Dan <laughs> Peral. I'm like, how many times have you done? this We podcast? did it live at, at Comic Con. That's what it is. I was like, I've seen you do this, and the, the Comic Con <laughs> ones are fun because like before when Brandon and I were in the green room here in L. A., we you know have a couple boxes of water. Um, <laughs> yeah. When you do the Comic Con one, it's just like, how many beers can I drink before yeah. we actually start? Before we get on stage, so. it seems like a fun time. It's fun to watch. I will say that. But hey, look, I'm not saying that we would ever have rivaled the ten years of Doug Love's movies, <laughs> but the four years that we got with this were pretty epic. I'm very glad that we're going out on a high note because if we're gonna have a last episode, it might as well be the last drag. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you're doing something that is that is watchable, that is madcap, that is crazy, that is a just a genre. Ben- Ending trip through the 1980s. The Last Dragon is it, Brandon Collins. It is. It's one of the craziest movies I've ever seen, and it's still like it still surprises me every time I watch it. Yeah, there's just so many, and it's kind of cool because there's a lot of things that you don't see black people do in this movie, like own a pizzeria, <laughs> uh, or like wear like just wear like wear the most Asian, gear, yeah, like, the most without, Asian outfits. <laughs> yeah, it's just insane. Eating por- popcorn with chopsticks, like it's yeah. a lot of wild stuff in this movie. This movie, we haven't even scratched the surface, <laughs> folks, and yeah. it's 61 percent fresh, which is. And it's not always been the case with The Last Dragon. See, here on Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong, we kind of pride ourselves on either defending movies that have been maligned by the tomato meter or maybe taking the movie down a peg that just got a little too big for its britches with the tomato meter and what the critics said when it came out. The Last Dragon was a rotten movie, Jacqueline. Yeah. And it was rotten, making it a qualifier for our book, The Rotten Movies We Love. And this was in the cult classics section. Yeah. And it's gone up too fresh since its initial rotten tomato meter in large part thanks to you and this was one of your contributions to the book yeah we all got to pick uh specific ones that we wanted to write about when the book came out and i was the first one to say the last dragon and it was again it was at 59 percent, and so it was in that like questionable realm there's a lot lower scores ones fresh on the, adjacent fresh adjacent but i was so happy that i got to do this one it i was just rereading it like looking up for this episode and yeah man this was I feel like if you're an anime kid, this was part of like a moment for you in movies. I think if you were a martial arts black kid, this was a moment for you in movies. It tapped into, again, just a cultural sort of synergy. The Venn diagram of black kids that like anime and black kids that like action movies and black kids that, you know, felt they missed out on the black exploitation of the 70s. Like that that is a round circle, you know, Uh, and this movie is kind of at the heart of it. And I I as much as I know that the behind the scenes of this is not kind to it. Uh, I I will always love uh, Barry Gordy for for setting out to make this happen. Yeah, so Barry Gordy, the the legendary, the hit maker of Motown, <laughs> yeah. decides I, I think I'm going to produce this movie. And uh, you're right, it's got inspirations from really. If you just look at the world, this is this is like Pangea. Yeah. This is like everything. Yeah. You're incorporating stuff from all corners of the globe into this one story we're talking about. And I mean, it's 86 percent fresh with the audience, and so. Clearly, yes. the audience that comes to this movie and rewatches it and rewatches it. I mean, like our movie, the last time we were talking, Teen Witch, they still have screenings of this all over the place that Absolutely. will sell out because yep. people just love celebrating 
the mayhem that is this movie in both a, a sincere way and a, 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 we were all so young the first yeah. time we saw this <laughs> yeah. movie. Um, Brandon Collins, uh, 39th anniversary is is one of the reasons we're talking about this That's movie. Wild. It's almost 40 years young. Um, do you remember where you were when you first heard about The Last Dragon? First heard about The Last Dragon when I was in high school. Uh, mind you, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I grew up in a suburb, so I didn't have much exposure to things like The the Last Dragon in my friendship circle. And everything. <laughs> uh, but my Pretty friend, much just staying warm during the winter and yeah. go Wolverines. Right? Yeah, but my friend Baron, he was because he was a producer, he played um, The Glow. Yeah. And like uh, on the soundtrack, and I was like, "What is this?" He's like, "Dude, this is from the Last Dragon." I'm like, "What's the Last Dragon?" He's like, "You don't know the Last Dragon," <laughs> and but I didn't watch it until like my twenties. I didn't actually sit down and watch it, and I was like, "This is wild." But to Jacqueline's point, though, like now that I'm older, I've been doing like a lot of like uh, stuff in the industry. I realized the representation, how important it was, mm-hmm. and how at the moment this had to be like an incredible. Thing. This had to be like watching Black Panther. Yeah. Like, you're like, we never get to do this stuff. Like, yeah. as crazy as incoherent as this movie is, there's so many things where you could tell, like, the crowd was probably losing their mind right. during this moment. The kids you know? got to see themselves on the big screen in yeah. a way that they never had before that, that I think a lot of white kids just kind of took for granted from all those years of, like, white kids probably growing up watching, like, like stuff like the, like, Westerns back in, like, mm-hmm. the 60s, and then all through the 70s with, like, watching, you know, Chuck Norris or whoever oh, God, the big yeah. action star at the yeah. time was. Bruce Lee was kind of that transcendent figure yeah, um, when he was around but and so he is actually playing a huge factor in this movie yep. both behind the scenes and on the on yeah. the actual celluloid well I became aware of like how important like especially in hip hop culture like in the for a lot of black people like how much like uh because I wasn't really into kung fu stuff I watched a lot of westerns my grandfather's really into westerns but um the Rizza talked about in the the Tao Wu where he's like like in the hood like Kung Fu movies were like our jam. Like that's the thing that was our escape. And so when you see how prominent Bruce Lee's featured in this, it makes a lot of sense. Um, And just in regards to like where it fits in the the movie and the culture and stuff like that. I'll just add on top of that too. I think like, I mean, you look at obviously things like Wu-Tang. For me, the first time I saw The Last Dragon was actually, I forget what the Buster Rhymes video is where he is show enough in the video, but that <laughs> yeah. was the video. Oh, right, right. And the I football was, pads. Yeah. There was um, <laughs> my, my best friend at the time, um, she was in one of those crazy Christian families where they all had biblical names. Uh, oh, it was boy. like Javar. It was like, <laughs> like literally like, you know, like Malachi and Shamar and like everybody had a biblical <laughs> name. But all of Go her, on, it's time for dinner. seriously, all of her brothers were older than her and they were all into The Last Dragon and so we were watching the video on like MTV or not even MTV it was like the version of MTV where you could choose it like a jukebox Mm -hmm. and we were like trying to wait for the box video to come up for Busta Rhymes and we were like watching (laughs) that whole situation and they were like yeah that's from The Last Dragon we're like what what like we didn't Mm. know it was based off of something which is actually interesting about and why I love the movie so much is it's influenced so much subsequent black culture I mean there is literally an episode of Insecure where they're doing a screening for The Last yes, Dragon yeah. in it. So this is how dumb I am. Um, I, I, I I knew there was a movie called The Last Dragon. I probably c- could have recognized some images, but I saw The Last Dragon 1985. So immediately in my head when I realized we're doing this movie is I'm thinking, okay, dragon, because like dragon, just dragons yeah. were huge in the 80s. Like uh, Game of Thrones and, and uh, How to Train Your Dragon is adorable for the kids today. Back in the 80s, every kid was obsessed with dragons. Yeah. You had like Dragon Slayer. Dragon and, Heart. And Dragon, dragon Heart w- was the 90s, but it was also still like, oh, the, the, like let's tell a story with like a really cool dragon. I thought this was a cheesy 80s dragon movie. Oh. So, <laughs> I, so I, Ooh, I text you Brandon. You surprised. Been trying to get Brandon on for a while and Brandon's like hey I'll be in town and I'm like hey have you heard of seeing The Last Dragon by any chance and like I, I didn't see you because we were texting yeah. but it felt like your face lit up when I presented this <laughs> I as like, an yeah, option yeah let's yeah. do it let's do this absolutely <laughs> no I 61%. would question, I would question now, his your your black card if you texted a black man and they were like what movie yeah. like I'd be like where were you we literally talked you? about it on my movie podcast oh. like when we reviewed it because like I, it was like my third time seeing it they were like bro like Every black person has to see this movie. It like, there's does. very few required films for black people like that you have to absolutely see. Otherwise, people raise eyebrows at you. And All right, last so, one of them. so let me ask you to do this though, because Jacqueline and I now like putting the pressure on the guest. Yeah. If I were to ask you to give a, a surface level synopsis of the Last Dragon, what would you say? Uh, I would say it's about this 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 lost brother who's been studying uh, kung fu for a long time. <laughs> And is trying to meet, achieve the ultimate level. And he, his master gives him this like a very uh, vague 
task of finding the the master, right? And all the while, he has this antagonist Shonuff, who essentially thinks he's the best. Bruce Leroy won't engage with him, so Shonuff is on the side, like doing everything he can to antagonize this guy into a confrontation. Meanwhile, there's a aspiring <laughs> Tiffany wannabe singer who's trying to get her music videos on like this famous uh, MTV esque. Uh, show that's ran by Vanity. Her boyfriend, who's this rich mobster kind of businessman, I don't know, he's scheming to get Vanity to put her stuff on the show. And all this intertwines because Bruce Leroy falls in love with Vanity's character. Um, it's This is really hard because <laughs> <laughs> it's just so many different plot lines. Uh, You're doing great so far. Long story short, the bad guy who's trying to... Um, Encourage to force Vanity into putting on uh, his girlfriend on a platform. He kidnaps her. He hires all these goons to fight uh, Bruce Leroy. It all comes to a head at this warehouse where then Shonuff also shows up. Mind you, Shonuff at this point has destroyed the family business, which is a pizzeria, mm-hmm. um, and further antagonizing uh, Bruce Leroy. He also embarrasses Bruce Leroy at his own dojo by forcing him to kiss his feet. Uh, instead of beating up his students. It's very <laughs> crazy, very brutal, actually, kind of mean, but uh, it all comes to a head at this warehouse where then uh, Bruce Leroy realizes that the master is within himself, where, where then he achieves the glow, even though Shonuff already has his glow, but they fight the glow together, and then uh, he defeats Shonuff and also defeats the businessman who shoots a gun, uh, bullet at him. He catches the bullet with his teeth, a la, like, you know, this urban legend they heard about Bruce Lee, Leroy and all as well because he gets his vanity at the end and they uh, have a party. Almost 10 years before Ace Ventura caught a bullet in his yep. teeth. Yeah. Well, it was very Roadhouse. Yeah. yeah. Which Roadhouse. one came out first? Yeah. Where, like, you hear, like, you know, there's like... This came one... out first. This yeah. was 85. Okay. Roadhouse was 88. Because remember, there's that quick line. It's like, oh, yeah, I heard he catch a bullet with his teeth. And then, like, you just... And they're like, what? And then they just keep moving on. And then it actually happens to the end where it's, you know, Dalton, they're like, I heard he ripped out a guy's throat with his bare hands. And you're like, what? And then he does that. And yeah. you're like, this is so... The dumb. influences that this movie had, like, it it was a hit. It wasn't as big a hit as they thought, but it was a hit. And it influenced a lot of subsequent media, not just in black culture, just in culture, period. I mean, the, the, this movie was uh, a, a revolution in in many ways. And, and both with just being a, a profitable piece of cinema, because I don't think people really, this movie did very well when it came out in terms of its budget. It was not oh, made yeah. for a lot, and it ended up making three or four times back what it cost to put into it back in 1985. So we got two minutes with Tim, where Tim is going to tell us what the critics were saying at the time. But very quickly, Brandon, I'm going to go to you first, then Jacqueline. 61%. So now it's fresh. Yes. It wasn't always fresh. Now it's fresh. Is Rotten Tomatoes right or wrong? I think that's it's right. It. Okay. Yeah. Now it's it right. right. Now I, it's right. I, 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 yeah, like fifty nine percent was that, that that was rotten, and that's too low. No, it just can't be rotten. It shouldn't be rotten. Yeah. I think there are, there's definitely a lot of problems with it, but I think in regards to its legacy, its impact, and there are, you know, at the time, like they worked with what they got. I think if if they had the talent of today, I think this could be like a masterpiece. I think this would be like so it still stands the test of time, but I think this would be something that's like up there in some of the best action martial arts movies of all time. Whereas this is just like flat people, you have to watch this. This is like epic. Yeah, I mean, you're you, representation. You, I, I think that's a good way to put it. Is is you came together and you had you did the best you could with the ingredients, yeah. kind of that yeah. we had. So with that being said, I'll 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 co-sign. I think that the '60s is a perfect place for this movie. I think it does deserve to be fresh. I mean, if especially if you incorporate legacy and all of the sort of inspiration that this movie took and then gave back. I think 61% is a fine place for it. We think Rotten Tomatoes is right. And on our last episode of Rotten Tomatoes is wrong, we all say, "Eh, maybe it's right now. But the wrong was rectified. The wrong was rectified, and I feel we were a part of that. All right, let's see what the critics were saying. I I guess this is, uh, yeah, it's almost 40. I can't believe it's almost 40 years ago. It's wild. 1985. It was almost 40 years ago when Marty McFly went back to the 1950s which seems so long ago, but that was only 30 years ago. This was 40 years ago. This is longer than that. Tim Ryan, Two Minutes with Tim. (laughs) One more time. Cue it up. Two minutes with Tim. Most of us don't spend our days getting in fights or escaping dangerous situations. So the movies can provide us with visceral, vicarious thrills. Most of us don't fall in love every day. So the movies can give us secondhand butterflies in the stomach. And real life doesn't have an awesome soundtrack, nor does it have the kind of kinetic visual sense and quick cuts that only the movies can supply. 
So what's wrong with a movie that has all of those things? Or in the case of The Last Dragon, sometimes all of those things happening at the same time. Well, as far as the critics went, one person's blast of energy is another person's cacophony. The Last Dragon is fresh at 61% on the tomato meter with 23 reviews, and it has an 86% audience score. So what did the critics have to say? In a fresh review, Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune wrote, The Last Dragon is first and foremost a romantic comedy, and a very sweet one at that. And that's why its martial arts combat scenes work so well. We've been given enough time to care about who's kicking the stuffing out of whom. However, in a rotten review, Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times wrote, It's so entertaining that I could almost recommend it, if it weren't for an idiotic subplot about a gangster and his girlfriend, a diversion that brings the movie to a dead halt every eight or nine minutes. The Rotten Tomatoes critics' consensus reads, The Last Dragon is a flamboyant genre mashup brimming with style, romance, and an infectious fondness for kung fu. But audiences might find the tonal whiplash more goofy than endearing. So that's The Last Dragon. Let's kick it back to Jacqueline and Mark, who have been training for months in a thus far fruitless attempt to possess the power of the glow. Back to you. <laughs> the glow was in us the whole time. Everybody yeah. knows, got the glow, got the glow, the glow. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I guess it does help summoning the glow if you wear giant red shoulder pads. Um, n- n- nothing else needs to be on your upper body. The yeah. wardrobe is like, that's you could never pull that off again. No. I don't know how it works, but it just works in this weird world. But if you try to do that, like, that's cuckoo bananas. It what is they cuckoo do. bananas. I feel like Shonuff sleeps in those shoulder pads. I mean, I think Barry Gordy, for say what he understood... He understood how to make things that were going to permeate culture, the look of it, the feel of it. He knew how to build worlds. I mean, he built Motown, which was a world, you know what I mean, in the midst of not the great part of Detroit. But he was able to build that world within it. And this was him building a new world, the intersection of black culture and Asian culture. And so he had to have the right costuming. And it's the right costuming. like because. The dialogue that Shonuf has, how can you not have a character that looks the way that he looks, <laughs> that's talking the way that he talks? It's one of the most perfect 80s villains. I've only seen this movie once, and I saw it three days ago for the first time. <laughs> it holds mm-hmm. up. Uh, let's go to movie talk, Brian. Yeah, because, I mean, you say, like, what the heck is this movie? So my first experience seeing this was three days ago, and I'm like, again, I I, I realized what the movie was very early on, yeah. and I had a ball watching it. Like, I actually liked all the madcap. Sort of felt like Who Framed Roger Rabbit with Eddie Arcadian yeah. and and, yeah. uh, and and Faith, uh, uh, God for it's uh, Angela Vaccaro. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the other starlet that yeah. like, and they're yelling at each other. And then you have all these like, I mean, Mike Starr from, from Dumb and Dumber's in this movie. And William H. Macy yeah. has yep. a scene in this movie. That was so random. Yeah. Keisha Knight Pullman is in this movie. I'm like, Rudy from the right. Cosby Show is in this. Yep. So, Can I just tell you that the vanity storyline for, do you know the story about why, um, first of all, like why that Cindy Lauper storyline was there? No, no, but okay. right. So that's that's basically who Angela is, and she was actually modeled after Cindy yes, Lauper. Yes, where okay. she's the one who wants to get her stuff on Vanity's yes. TV show, which is what like American Bandstand kind of yeah, yeah dance like and MTV, soul training, Total MTV, Request MTV, yeah. Live thing. Yeah, check me out on this um, to make sure this is right. Check Cindy Lauper's age, but I believe this was the whole thing. So Vanity, despite being sort of like Prince's protege, when she was first trying to get some of her music on MTV, they were like, we can't put you on here. You're not really marketable to us because she wasn't is... black enough for what they would consider to be the black section. And she wasn't, in their opinion, pop enough to be mm. in the pop section. But That's they so had crazy. already adopted Cindy Lauper, who I don't think people remember. Cindy Lauper was doing like wrestling shows when she was first coming no, up. And like, she was basically this sort of like somewhat rich girl. Like her dad had like a pretty affluent life and funded her to be in this. And she was much older than what the typical MTV artists were. And so this was basically Vanity speaking to <laughs> the MTV oh, wow. execs to say, you're going to let this, and the ageism in this is not great, this old lady be um, a pop star on MTV, but you're not going to let me be a pop star, even though she's basically just got these Machiavellian guys behind us and she's like a 30-year-old whatever. But yeah, like right. that was this. And... She only agreed to do the movie because she didn't want to, after Purple Rain, just be another love interest. Because if you look at Purple Rain, there's not a lot that she has going on yeah. in that movie outside of <laughs> Besides Prince's. Besides getting slapped around a few yeah, times. Yeah, like I get right. abused and Prince and Prince is dreamy. That was her whole yeah. story in that one. And so Barry, to get her to sign on to do this movie, had to give her a beefed up part. And she suggested, I want to speak to the MTV executive generation. And Purple Rain had come out the year before The Last yes. Dragon. Yes. So it, it kind of makes sense yeah. with that. 
that timeline that uh, and again, you know, Barry Gordy, just uh, he's the guy's known for finding talent yes. mm-hmm. and just being like to like take you to the stars. And so with this movie, I mean, again, Brandon, you said the first time you saw it was in your 20s. Like, did you get what this was right away? Did you walk into kind it? Kind of, because um, my friend Dylan, shout out to Dylan Stevenson, uh, who's a comedic writer, he showed up at my annual Halloween party as show enough. And I had no context <laughs> about what was happening, but he looked exactly like him. He was like, who's the best? And I was like, what is going on? And everyone was like, this is the best costume ever. And so I was like, I have to watch this movie now. And so, um, yeah, it was my, my early 20s, but... All is forgiven because I, I greatly enjoyed it and I greatly got what it was. I think now even more, I'm able to see even more jokes and weird stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. Like when, when Shoda breaks the, the TV that has the Cindy Lauper yes. girl playing and the dad's like, that's not even mine. I don't own that, yeah. man. Like, <laughs> this is like, rented. Yeah, no, this is great. But um, I, I fell in love with Vanity immediately. Like, like between this and Atch and Jackson, obviously Purple Rain, like I just was like, I don't know how Vanity wasn't like the biggest star yeah. in the world in the 80s. Yeah. Um, because she's like Halle Berry meets with like mixed with Paula Patton kind yeah. of like mm-hmm. she just has like kind of that likability on screen. Um, I can't test what she was like in her, you know her personal life, but on screen, I'm just like, how was she not like the biggest star of the '80s? And, and you believe that she is that pop star? It like, was it she, was a she, different she, time. She, yeah. it, it, as yeah. far as acting goes, she pretty much puts this movie on her back. I mean, I will give Tamak, who plays uh, Lee Ward Green slash Bruce Leroy, a, a lot of credit <laughs> for so right. staying in staying in in what he wants to be. Yeah. yeah, you can look at this movie through the the lens of like this is just like every dude's fantasy, mm. but but there is such an earnestness to how Tamak plays this role where he learned to act on set. I mean, he was yeah. a yes. gifted uh, martial artist who was a black belt already, but then and like cast is literally as a nobody, kind of plucked from obscurity to be in this role. Jacqueline, the first time you saw it, were you were you moved? Were you transported, or was it just like? Oh, I've heard about this thing, and now I'm glad I saw it. This was very much in my, like, living color days. So, like, I was still at home for sure, and I definitely rented this. I rented this at our version of the, like, it wasn't Blockbuster. It was, like, the local video store. We had video up there, yeah. Yeah, like, the local video store that wasn't that. They did have a VHS copy of this, and that's where I saw it. And I think I saw it because I watched I'm Gonna Get You Sucker. Oh, wow. And somebody told me that I needed to watch this (laughs) next. Because, again, it was, like, the Buster Rhymes reference. All of that was around that same sort of like 90s mm-hmm. sort of like timeline for me. And like, that was when I was like, I still had to get my mom to take me to the video store. It was Hastings. That's what it was. Hastings mm. video rental. I wonder, if, I mean, in Living Color is, is such an interesting gateway in this because you can you can clearly tell in Living Color how much they celebrated their influences mm-hmm. where they probably grew up in the in the 70s black exploitation era. Yep. But so they, so by the time Last Dragon comes out, Everybody like, like the, the Wayans is in that cast and stuff probably yeah. know exactly what this movie is yeah. and probably loved it as a result. I mean, you could uh, there's an argument you made Last Dragon is even more insane than I'm going to get you, sucker, which is just Absol- a straight oh, up. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Ab- yeah. Absolutely. Because I mean, they kind of play it straight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they all. That's I, the thing. That, that's the thing. Everybody is. Everybody's giving a thousand percent yes. <laughs> in this movie. They may not know which movie they're in, but they're giving it yes. their all. Yes. A- absolutely. Even the white people that they they got to show up because the girl that plays Cindy Lauper. I hate what Ebert says about that storyline because the line that she gives. Maybe I'm just another girl with big <laughs> from Kew Gardens. That is a bar. Like it's just <laughs> she stands up for herself. You know what I mean? But yeah. she's like, but you're making your money off of me, and I think that was actually a really great bit of empowerment. But these all these movies, Last Dragon, I'm gonna get you sucker even Hollywood shuffle they were all born out of what ended up being the worst time for sort of black representation in the 80s because basically like right. Eddie Murphy got to be a character on screen maybe if you were lucky Wesley Snipes or Denzel got yeah. to be a character on screen and every other actor who were likely just as talented who went to the same theater groups who did the same things that they did they could only play gang member number three and all of these movies got born out of those guys knowing how talented they are not being able to do anything past that. I mean, I think Samuel L. Jackson talked about it. He was in a theater group, and it was Morgan Freeman, Denzel Washington, uh, Lawrence Fishburne, him. <laughs> and, like, who? <laughs> what? Who, I didn't even the, know that. Yeah, they did a play together. Like, who's in the B squad Jesus of that crew? Christ. You know what right, I mean? Like, that right. is it's Lawrence. Yeah, is that- <laughs> <laughs> no offense to it, but it's but Lawrence. But you know what I mean? Uh, but like, that is the kind of, like, I always tell like people. the 85 bears of acting. <laughs> I mean, I tell people, man, when you look at a black person in entertainment, trust me when I say this, they are probably more talented than the <laughs> last five right, people that right. you've seen. Because as a black person, the number of roles is so limited. And so if you are making it, 
you have to have bars. Like, you have to be like, um, they're talking about uh, Divine Joy Randall. She's going to win this Oscar. I'm like, yeah, because she went to Yale and, like, cut her teeth in theater and had to go to London to get decent parts first. And then she came here because yep. that's how hard it is. And she was lucky because, well, not lucky, but she was fortunate enough to get a great role in Dolomite is My Name. Eddie Murphy saw something in her because that's what got her into hold over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I remember seeing Dolomite. I'm like, who was this actress? She's, like, phenomenal. Then she did, uh, you know, Mersna, the... Yeah. Yeah. What's the comedy with Steve Martin? I'm blanking on a name. I don't know. Um, why. Uh, only the, Murders in the Building. Only Murders in the Building. Oh, right, um, but right, right, yeah. but her first role that she, because she tried to do the um, pilot season here and lost everything that she was up for mm. to Octavia Spencer's. You know what I mean? Like, that's what yep. happens, right? Like, there's one person they've yep. already decided is going to be this type of role. And so she went to London and she did Ghost. She was in the West. Wow. Uh, in the Western version of that, because she did an artist workshop repertoire at Yale. And I mean, look, Daniel, uh, Daniel Brooks, who's nominated with her this year. She went to Juilliard. Yep. Like, these are not. <laughs> There's Hawkins a reason why Julia. Jacqueline hosts an award show podcast. <laughs> she knows because all she has yeah. all this information stored in her brain. But I just want to say, like, uh, even this where it's like, you know, Barry Gordy maybe never got to be the the movie mogul that he intended to be. But on his very first movie, he made an incredibly successful and incredibly relevant and incredibly watchable thing that is still beloved almost 40 years later. It ain't by accident. You can't take your eyes off this movie. No. Once it starts. Yeah. And and it starts with that with just a, a classic training sort of sequence yeah. Yeah. montage. And Starts apparently, with it. <laughs> as the story goes, that's, I mean, Tamak doing, the actor doing all the moves, and he's got this, you know, ancient sort of master splinter uh, training him, <laughs> human know. master splinter. Yes. And dude is not just like, okay, good, let, let's do 10 reps here, and then we'll start working the bag. Dude is having him go through his paces, and then on the meat, he's shooting arrows at him. Yeah. He has a bow and arrow, and he's shooting at him, and Leroy is just chopping these arrows. Apparently, that was a real stunt. Yeah. It was a yeah. real stunt. It took him like two hours, but I mean, again, if you put Brandon and I in a room and give us a bow and arrow and say, how long is it going to take before we actually get you chopping one of these arrows? We as can we do sh- it, though. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want an arrow in our, our body. I'm not saying we're not going to try, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, we're walking out of there bloody, you know? it's And and so, like, like you, you see... The discipline, and I love that we open with that because it does ground the movie somewhat. Because the movie's going to go all over the place with a lot of crazy over-the-top characters, yeah. but it does have a grounded yeah. heart that we establish right off the bat. Yeah, you have to buy in that Bruce Leroy is fully engrossed in this culture because when he exits that, you know, the the, the space for the training, and he's He puts walking. his hat on? Yeah. yeah, when he put on the hat, I'm just right. like, well, you, you have to buy that this is the guy. Like, when he goes to his, when he's meditating on the roof, he comes through the window like Spider-Man. Yeah. He's like, Mama-san, <laughs> Daddy-san. I was just like, this is so crazy, but the family's just like, that's our, that's our kid, you know? And you just have to embrace, like, this world. If you don't, if you fight against it, you're not going to enjoy this movie. You have to fully, like, give this movie a warm hug to in order to fully enjoy it for what it is. And it's brilliant that they did the montage as a start because that's normally like the showstopper of these types of movies. Mm. And they led with that. So, you know, they yeah. had to go someplace higher with that. And that's why they have their version of the force, which is the glow. Well, I, was gonna, I, yeah. I wanted more. I wanted more show enough. Yeah. More, I was going to say show enough with the glow. I think that that yeah. would have been hilarious. The place that they take this higher from the opening sequence is now we're in a we're in a packed movie theater oh and we're God. loving the martial <laughs> arts movie. And and I love that scene because that's what I my very distant, vague memory of what being in a movie theater in the 80s was like where it just maybe we, we you know we had less entertainment options there less ways to kind of get our get our juice out but like I, my buddy Steve Simone is a great comic he he would tell me stories of like seeing Rocky 4 in a movie theater when it came out and everybody gave it a standing ovation when he not when, when he cuts Drago yeah. but like people mm. getting so into a movie and then that's show enough's entrance yeah. to take it even further over yeah. the top and now we're fighting everybody's trying to challenge show enough and it's like none of it's working and you just realize that's who our good guy is yeah. and that's where they're coming from this is our bad guy that's where he's coming from and it's just these two forces of nature that you know are eventually going to clash i also want to shout out the diversity in that movie theater scene like there's yeah. a lot of just yeah. different representation in that scene that I think it's lost in a lot of folks. Because like a blinking, like, oh, like, okay. There's like a lot of like representation in regards to like a, a trans community and also like uh, just like different body body types and stuff. Like it was just very interesting seeing that scene and like how it's just like, this is the world. And it's weird seeing like Hollywood regress a little bit. Well, yeah. not a little bit, quite a bit after this. Right, right. And it's, 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 it's just wild seeing that scene and like, 
Oh, it's a movie that looks like this. New York. Yeah. It's a movie that actually looks like it was filmed in it New York feels like at New York. that the time. 80s, yeah. At right, that sure. time. And that's what's crazy because now when you look at those movies that were quote unquote New York at that time and they look like it's from Connecticut, you're like, how? <laughs> <laughs> like, how did y'all think that this is New York? It is yeah. interesting. Just you talk about the regression as far as representation goes, where it was like it was such a pullback from that. And, and I, I don't really know why other than because it didn't feel marketable. It didn't feel like that was unmarketable, though, because that, that that appeals to everybody. But I guess then Hollywood got very safe yeah. after well, that. And I, and it probably ebbs and flows. But it feels like that the, the pushback to that was just a very safe, static kind, even action movies. I think you have to remember the press of New York at that time in the 80s was very much that this was a hellscape that you mm-hmm. would go to to die. And that was definitely what people were permeating. So a lot yeah. of the media that was being created around it, they wanted to sort of like push back on that. Like that's the reason why Friends looks the way that it does. And Seinfeld looks the it's way before that it the does. Before the M&M store opened in Times Square. You know what I mean? Like they were trying to be like, no, it's not as bad as it is. Because shows like Law and & Order and shows like, you know, NYPD Blue made it seem like, you know, everybody's murdering. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that keeps us safe is like this, Jimmy Smith. You know what I mean? This, this thing. Dennis Franz's ass is the only thing holding this city together. You know I remember I mean? my mom talked about that scene. I had never watched that show, <laughs> but I remember she's like, oh, they showed his butt. I was like, what? Oh, <laughs> that guy? Yeah. <laughs> I just remember thinking, like, finally you can show this stuff on network TV, and that's the choice. Yeah. Like, I, I've been watching the the Static Channel trying to see anything I can. And now we finally have the chance to do a number of television and that's the that's your number one option. I mean, I don't know about everybody else was just waiting on Jimmy Smith's, but we didn't get that until he went to Law and Order. So, you know, we had to I'm sorry, went to LA Law. <laughs> so who's our what's our favorite standout performance here? Brandon, start with you. Is it is it just the over the topness baddie that, that is Julius show Carey enough? has shown enough. It yeah. has to be because he's he sells that character that's completely it's one of the most off the wall. Like I'm doing um a sleeve of villains on my arm. I'm doing uh, oh, villains and can heroes. Can see some right? of the goods? Uh, I mean, like right now, I got Ghostface, I got uh, Joker, and I got Lil Zay from City of God. Yeah. Showing up is going on here. Yes. Like, he's so crazy. And just this outfit, his whole aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, To the point where I'm like, I don't think, I don't think Bruce Leroy beats him. Yeah. He's one of those villains where you're like, I know you need a happy ending, but I don't think the good guy wins in this yeah. final battle. Kind of like Voldemort. I, I yeah. feel like Voldemort yeah. brought his C- minus game to the that end fight at Deathly Hallows Part Two, he got Harry just got very lucky that they actually destroyed all the. I've I've talked about this at Nazim before. <laughs> he got very lucky. Harry got very lucky that they destroyed all the horror cruxes. Yeah, and that's what threw Voldemort off his game because he was like, "How did this actually it shook happen?" Him. Yeah, he's it like, shook "I split him. my soul into right. like six different parts because he didn't know about Harry yet." Yeah. yeah, so it's like we're in the thick of March Madness. That that, that was that was NC State beating Houston. That was yeah. <laughs> that was UNLV losing in the tournament. Like, like there's no way that that should yeah. if you ran it back. I think the only reason why it was is the braggadocious nature of show enough. Like, look, this is hip hop culture. And there is very much a part of hip hop culture Mm -hmm. that says I'm the baddest before you actually do it. But then we have the battle. And the only reason why you have to temper that just slightly is because if you say you are the baddest, you have to back it up. And I think for show enough, the reason why he ended up losing that battle is he really didn't give Leroy a chance at beating him at all. And so when he saw him have the glow, that was like Voldemort destroying the the Horcruxes, which I I will say, I think show enough is the greatest character, but I really want to give it up uh, for Tamak because I remember the first time I saw this and when he does the glow, I thought that was like, Hot, like Lord of the Rings level CGI. Okay. I thought that was the coolest visual effect to ever happen. I was like, this is cinema. George Lucas like, is kicking himself for not having that be the force. Like this was like when they show you the first, like um, when they show you the first, like um, like death, like not the Death Star, but one of the Imperial. Oh, the Cruiser. Star Destroyer. Yeah. yeah, when it just comes across the screen and you're like, it's still going. Like mm-hmm. that's the wonder that I felt when I first mm. saw him do that. So I have to give him up for that because. He's Gal Gadot in the first Wonder Woman. He is so earnestly like, yeah, she doesn't think she's going to date me, but she actually is. You know, all of that is much harder to play than the biggest, loudest, I'm the baddest, and who doesn't know it? Like, that's an easier role to play. It's harder Just to do that. Okay. Be- because he has the ability of Superman, but the whole movie, he's he's Clark Kent in Superman yeah. too, where he just like acts like he doesn't have mm. these powers. And so like the, like the kiss my feet scene, but when he's at his dojo yeah. and he's teaching all these kids and then here comes Shonuff and he's like, you got to kiss my feet. We know he's going to kick the crap out of him, 
but he does he does it anyway, and he's he's like so respectful to a maddening fault with the with the audience because like look, look dude, we, you, we know you're the good guy here. We want you to get the girl. We want you to mm-hmm. to to defeat Shonoff. We want you to find the glow. Like just do the stuff. And because he's such a good kid, it it just takes the whole movie for that to happen. Yeah, and I will say the rom com uh, aspect of it plays so well. It's just unfortunate that everything outside of her story that is not part of the rom-com doesn't. Because when they are, like, giving each other googly eyes, I was like, this is love. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, when they were doing their little, not sex scene, but they're yeah. like, I'm falling in love with you scene. You I know felt like I the mean? little brother every time they looked at each other, I'm like, man, she don't like you like that. <laughs> That's how I felt. I was like, I don't buy this. Like, I bet that might just be Brandon being a hater. I think you're a little bit too loved and to believe I this think- corny mother- Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I think that <laughs> I think Tamac got so lucky that that little brother wasn't older. Like, like because if little brother had five more years on him, then oh, yeah. then he, that personality is just going to win over. Yeah, he Laura in a way that that Tamac, all the karate's great. Thanks for saving the day. I'm going with. With, with, with little brother, yeah, he got here. thrown in a trash can. It's still, like I could get here more uh, <laughs> yeah. quicker than you. Just scrappy, you know. He, he did the robot out of like <laughs> constraints, <laughs> like. But I, I, I honestly think Vanity might be the best in this whole movie, simply because you you buy her as everything. You buy her as a credible love interest. Mm-hmm. I think she's really good at conveying that to uh, against Tamac, where it's like. It, you can tell that there's some sort of chemistry here, and he's obviously trying to fight it and stay in his, you know, monk-like discipline. But like a she, Jedi, she, she's not throwing herself at him, but she also clearly there's an attraction, and I think that the performance walks that line. And so to have that, you know, in, in this movie where there's all these, you know, over the top kind of Bond villains, and it also, I, I think that this movie it, it doesn't indict itself as much as it does just kind of like. Hold up the microscope to every like silly action movie that we yeah. all grew up with, yeah. where the villains are ridiculous. Like yes. they, they're all Doctor Evil, yeah, including Eddie Arcadian, who yep. has this weird beast in a in, in, in a fish tank that we don't even know what it is. We just know it's not good. Ah, uh, Eddie I, Arcadian. So I good. imagine it's piranhas, right? That's it's like got to be something yeah. like that. I mean, I don't think they had the budget for piranhas, no, but that's what no, they're. No. they're they definitely... had the budget to make the water bubble in a menacing manner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will also say that um, the the lesson and the reason why she's the smartest woman in the movie, the Vanity's character is, she understands the lesson that it takes a lot of women, a lot of therapy and bad men to know, and that is find a kind man. <laughs> okay, kids, find the kind man. She's making the right decision. I think, yeah, I, I just worry about their first day when they go to the movie theater and she sees that he's eating popcorn with chopsticks. She might be like, this ain't, <laughs> this ain't the move. Like, what are you doing? It's like, dude, we get it. You like martial <laughs> arts. You, you don't have to sell it this hard, yeah. man. Also, Can, I believe we're at he a was fine Asian. restaurant. Can you take the hat off, please? I thought he was Asian uh, for like the longest time until he did a screening at the Alamo Draft House where I met him and he's like, no, I'm not Asian. And I was like, did you did you bring up something like, like when I found will you out sign John... my Chinese food menu and he No, he just said it in the QA and I was like, this is like finding oh, out John really? B is white. <laughs> wow. Like it was like a whole thing. I was like, no, John B is black. He's a light skinned brother. And they're like, no, he's not. He's white. And I was like, no, this is what it was. When I found out he wasn't Asian, I was like, what? He's not. Look, we mentioned all of the uh, the, the many kind of uh, up and comers that pop into this movie, like uh, William H. Macy, yes. uh, a, a Mike star, uh, Keisha Knight Pulliam. But we should also mention Ernie Rias Jr. Yeah. Who uh, Brandon and I just pretty much Kino. refer to as Kino yep. <laughs> because he was so transcendentally good in Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze. Yeah. And just an effervescent personality, kick-ass martial artist. Yep. And you see the roots of that here. And his dad, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because his oh, dad yeah. was with him in Surf Ninjas. They mm-hmm. both were part of that bomb. But, uh, you know, he, like, Kino's a legendary uh, character because I think one, I was around that age when that movie came out. And so, like, that was my door into Because I'm not going to be like, I'm a turtle. You know what I mean? So that was, like, kind of the window into that world. I was the same way. We needed to see a human interact with the yeah. turtles to be like, oh, now I can, like, get into their club. Yeah. yeah. And then you also kind of saw, it was weird, like, from a kid from the suburbs, you kind of saw through Kino. And I get this is very, like, and listen to me, how you get into gang culture? Because he got, you know, with the foot clan <laughs> and everything. Got him with yeah. the foot clan, yeah. got why he, Oh, that's it why he has community. cautionary tale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was the, that was the backlash about Secret of the Ooze. Correct me if I'm wrong. The first Turtles was very dark, too dark. Yes. And they yes. were like... This they took is, away the weapons. Yeah, they're they like, we can't do it like this. And then Secret of the Ooze was more of like the kid version it was right? more it was more bright and fun and the jokes were yeah. flying even faster yeah. um but, michelangelo's unhinged in that one yeah. oh he's a nutcase yeah he's just put person like, ah, yeah. <laughs> they're like what <laughs> michelangelo oh you okay but i maintain the best that pizza has ever looked 
on the big screen is at the beginning of Ninja Turtles 2, Secret of the Use. There's yes. a scene just kind of lampooning the how mon- obsessed with pizza our culture yep. is. Everybody in every street corner in New York is eating slices montage, of pizza. montage, yep. It looks so It looked good. good. It looked yeah. really good. Oh, my God. I, I remember so opening good. nights seeing that. I want pizza, Mom. She's yeah. like, we're not... No, I took. We get, took you to the yeah. movie. She's this like, this movie no. theater cost me. This movie trip cost me twenty five dollars. <laughs> it's nineteen ninety two. No, <laughs> we I, don't I, have it. I took karate for uh, my brother. And I took karate classes at James City Rec Center for three weeks, and <laughs> and then my mom found out we really only were going. We we, we were like into like the turtles and Van yeah. Dam and stuff. It would have been into this if I'd seen it. Um, but there was a KFC on the way home. So I wanted to go by KFC, and I think that the KFC started becoming more of an attraction than actually going to karate class and <laughs> bl- and doing like fist push ups. I'm like, I can't do that. Do I was have- a black belt in Taekwondo. Sorry to no, go ahead. You're a black belt. I was a black belt, first degree black belt in Taekwondo. Really? And I stopped. I stopped. And I I used to do a bit about this, but it was just too sad. Like people <laughs> were like more like oh, they're like laughing. Uh, my school bully, because I, I got uh, the black belt when I was 13. And I found was like, you know what? I'm a, I'm a weapon now. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm not taking any stuff from Wesley anymore. And so he was picking on me. And I was like, dude, don't mess with me. Like, I can I can defend myself. You're Tamar. Yeah. He was in gym, in gym class. And he was like, show me what you got. And I was just got my fighting stance. And I went to kick him. And he caught my foot. And in my head, I remember being like, since they didn't tell me what happens if <laughs> the guy just grabs my foot. <laughs> he just, he threw me to the ground, just started punching me. Oh, and I was no. like, well. Well, yeah. I'm not going to class anymore. It's, it was like one of the most embarrassing, like it's one of the biggest life moments of like not getting too braggadocious and like too confident, but also like is Taekwondo worth it? You learned that you're not show enough. I, I learned that I'm not anybody. <laughs> also, <laughs> classroom is not real life. Like, like yeah, in the classroom there's <laughs> yes, rules, yes. but like you need to be a cage fighter to really fight like yeah. your high school and bully. The, yeah, yeah, the movie is like, I remember seeing Only the Strong. And, uh, oh my God. And it was the movie that where we're, so we're winning Capuela. And, and, and again, <laughs> it's such a beautiful art form. And, 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 and the experts in it can beat the crap out of you. Make no mistake. But I'm watching, I'm like, oh man, I could move like this next time like the, the bullies are around. But I'm like, I think I'm just gonna like, I, I, you forget how actual fights work. Like, go on, <laughs> go on Twitter and look at any fight in a stadium. Yep. That's how fights work. Yeah. Where it's just guys pulling on whatever they can, yep. just holding on, and it's a lot more just like like holding on for dear life than it is actual combat arts. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why I do think the um like the grapply type mixed martial artist, like the girl that's in True Detective this year, uh, yeah, Cal, yeah, like her. That girl can fight. Like, oh, yeah. She's an actual fighter, Like right? it's, yeah. it's so funny to me that that dude that, that did the first season of that is talking crap about her on Twitter. I'm like, if she saw you in person, right. you would Good be luck. a memory. <laughs> After that second season, he shouldn't talk about anybody. I mean, seriously, son. Anyway, I don't want to... But I'm like, but that's like real fighting now. Like MMA yeah. and like UFC, I don't really dig those things. But when I look at those dudes fight each other, I'm like, no, these dudes... Like, Colin McGregor looks like, no, I will hit somebody. You know what I mean? Like, legit. Is there, I mean, we're covering a lot of bases here, but that's sort of a testament to The Last Dragon and its legacy is that it does have a lot of tentacles that can spread out, whether it's in terms of culture, whether it's in terms of just making a good movie on a budget or having an impact in cinema. Um, Is there, like, I don't want to, like, Phantom Menace, you know, edit this, but is is there something that you would do less of or more of, Brandon? Like, if you, you look at it now and you look at where movies have come, do you keep it exactly the way it is? Or is there like, oh, well, we could have done without that and maybe this instead? I would have done where um, the main uh, bad guy, with Eddie. Eddie yeah. Arcadian, yeah. I think I would have had him when he was recruiting all like the other bad guys to like fight Sh- um, uh, Bruce Leroy. You hire Shona. It's almost like, you know, the Dark Knight where they all hired the Joker. Right, right. Up, do that. And then that's what leads to the, the big showdown, the third act, because I think it kind of happens abruptly. It's kind of random. Mm-hmm. When Shona just shows up, he's like, hey, it's yeah, time to do it yeah. now. Like, I think if there's like a proper buildup. And also, I do think, you know, this is what I love about some movies where you do like the villain, like, you know, the villain encounters in threes. Have... Have Bruce Leroy kind of fight Shonuff at one point, get defeated, so there's a bigger buildup for that final battle. Mm-hmm. I think More so than just, I, like, kicking, yeah. it, it getting kicked in the face because you were kissing his foot. Yeah, yeah, I forgot one movie I watched recently where it's, like, the main character, he gets in encounters with the villain two times before the final act, right? And it's, like, the first time he defeats the villain, the villain's, like, what just happened? And then the second time, the villain comes back bigger and badder, beats the the hero and then the right. third act he's like who's gonna win this and I think it would have been a little bit more uh, you would have been a little bit more on the edge of your seat during that final uh, encounter if that happened it yeah. does feel abrupt 
Yeah, Jacqueline, where, I mean, do you feel the same about this movie as when you wrote this? Because, like, critics can, you know, either soften or harden or just new eyes get put on movies. From the time that you wrote about this in the book Rotten Movies We Love, have any of your feelings changed on the movie since your latest rewatch? I don't think my feelings have changed. I've just been happily surprised at how much I realized I'm not alone with my love mm. for this movie. I will. Uh, it's not a movie that I love as deeply when I first saw it, but what is, right? You know what I mean? But the the thing that is most significant about this one is I realize its influences. I realize how many people it influenced. I, there's not a single kid that I know that is black and likes anime that doesn't think about this movie. There's mm -hmm. not a single kid that I know that likes um, any kind of sort of like Asian influence cinema that also doesn't love this movie as well. Like you like John Woo, you've seen The Last Dragon. Yeah. And so I love that part about it. And so I would say my opinions on it haven't changed, but it's, it's sort of like the way it is. It's branched out into more things. Like when I watch... Uh, the Insecure episode, I'm like, yes, they're thinking the same things I do. When I watch Sorry to Bother You, I'm like, yes, they're thinking the same things I do. I, I will also add the thing that I would maybe sort of like add or, or subtract to this is I would lean more into what I think were the the hits of it and delete some of the other ones. I do think that secondary vanity storyline could be sh cut down significantly mm -hmm. and this would still be an incredible, joyous movie. But like one of the rotten reviews from Janet Maslin from New York Times was, it's crammed with kung fu, singing, rapping, dancing, and video art and no <laughs> moment goes by without at least three of those things transpiring simultaneously. That is where this movie lives in its heart. Like to me, that is a recommendation. <laughs> right, right. That's what I was saying. Yeah. I would say lean more into <laughs> that. Give me more DeBarge. Give me more um, oh, of boy. the music. Yeah. Give me more of the earnestness of this movie and less about trying to make it more than what it is. It can be just a collection of fun stories that happened in this world. Like this could be a more Pulp Fiction style story and it would be even more enjoyable. Yeah. The fact that they tried to weave together Dude. this storyline is where it, it's less enjoyable. Do you think that movie could get made though today? Because I will, without going into too much detail with the uh, with the writing I did um, a year ago for Universal. Yeah, my script is like the Last Dragon meets Scott Pilgrim in the world of Napoleon Dynamite, Ooh. and I kept getting told like you gotta. I, I kept getting told about the rules and like the things that are commercially appealing, and so what you just described, I think you would need to have like more of like the love story, more of like the this this weird dynamic with a, uh, I don't, I'm not. It depends on how you, you yeah. want to get it's it It's gotta made. be so frustrating as a writer to hear that though, because it's, it's like, incredibly frustrating. look yeah. at all those three movies you just married. Like all those movies were insanely profitable. Yeah. Yes. I, yeah. I would say yes, but I'm also of the belief. And again, this is my classic film nerd coming about. We are currently in a haze codes type moment with Hollywood where the people that are making decisions are handcuffing themselves against creativity. Mm -hmm. And the thing I think that is going to sort of shift that is not AI the way most people are thinking about it, but AI as it tools with creative filmmaking for people to not need the tools of Hollywood to make big things. And so I think... Just furthering going, the everybody's got a movie studio in their pocket now. Yeah, and I really do think that there were still limitations on mm -hmm. like what people could do um, previously, but now we're literally like at the very beginning of in maybe five more years, you will be able to make a movie with three actors and a whole bunch of CGI and sort of added elements that will make it look like a movie that will rival anything you see on screen. What the guy for Godzilla Minus One is doing, oh yeah, that is going to be mm -hmm. movie making. If that wins the Oscar, it's going to be a game changer. Yeah, and, and that is going to be the type of movie making that is going to start to permeate here. The budgets are going to become smaller. It's going to be a lot because they're going to be able to look as good as something that is made at a very high level. And when that happens, movies like his will get made. They will become the things that become hits. And then we're going to start the carousel all over again, just like it did when they stopped making uh, the MGM musicals and they started making really gritty new Hollywood movies of the 60s and 70s. That might be the most perfect way to encapsulate not just this episode <laughs> of Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong, but of the uh, sort of entire run of this show that we put together because we're here to talk about these individual movies and sometimes to have a laugh and a wink and a nod at them, but also to say, look, there's a lot of stuff that gets made. It's not always loved by the critics, but everybody's opinion is important and everybody's vision is important and what you bring to a movie and what you take out of a movie. And that's why we've had such a great time these last four years doing Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. So one last time, Brian, hit that outro music.
Uh, nobody puts together more copious notes than yes. uh, than Brian Perez, our uh, beloved producer, um, where you get fun nuggets like this movie did cost $10 million, $33 million worldwide gross. The number one movie, the box office that this came out was also a new movie. Friday the 13th, part five. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, I, everybody boy. loves to say, oh, we're in the movie where horror movies make a, a we're in the age where all these horror movies do well. Horror movies in the 80s, man. It didn't it, matter. Didn't matter what number it was. You have a property. Yep. You slap a you slap a, a Roman numeral on it. Give me number one of the box office. Yep. So Last Dragon fighting Jason Voorhees of all people, <laughs> and I would still kind of take Tamak in that matchup. Uh, Brandon Collins, it's so great finally Thank having you on having the show, me. getting here Appreciate just in the nick of time. Yes. Uh, I, I'm <laughs> glad to be here at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for closing up shop with us. Yeah. Um, how uh, how is everything going, and, and where can all the the people find you and and all your creations? Things are great. I'm glad to be out uh, west for a little bit. Um, folks can follow me in um, Threads and Instagram. That's usually where I'm at at Frodo underscore Blackens, uh, and you can check out my website FrodoBlackens.com, where you can get information about my movie review podcast. That's Ron. Tomatoes accredited it, so we did actually contribute in a positive way to that tomato meter. There you go, Last Dragon uh, at Medium P Podcast and all social media platforms, as well as check out uh, Drunk Black History, my show that I talk about uh, forgotten black uh, heroes or events that have contributed in a really, really great way to this country. That you know, unfortunately, our education systems are just refusing to acknowledge. Uh, you can check out the podcast and everything else at drunkblackhistory.com. Jacqueline, it might have been his review that pushed this into being a fresh film. I Definitely one of them. I will say, unfortunately, with movies like this, there's so many reviews. It takes a lot, but every bit helps. Yeah, every so, like, bit, get, when it's like, 59%. What is well, 59%? I will say for Paddington 2, my co-host, he gave a round of review of it, and <laughs> I, I thought the Elvis review gave us some hate mail. That was... That was intense. Don't people mess with white their, people was, in padding. That was really sandwiches. Not, it wasn't just white people. It was, it was, it was, it was wild. <laughs> really? The representation I, was uh, The people I know that are into that are a lot of like white British people, like feel good people. It's a fun movie though. Yeah, I'm not saying that it isn't, but I he have not talked bear. any noise on it, but they they have love for that movie yes. in a weird way. Jacqueline, the bear's cute. <laughs> okay. Even when in jail and wearing a pink... Uh, <laughs> he's, he's, he's even pink cuter. I, yeah, okay, wait. Let me just say, I did a panel with Bill Wishaw on this really dark movie about women and like sexual assault. And every third Woman person, talking? yes, every yeah. third person <laughs> was coming and talking to him about oh, the damn Wishaw, bear. Yeah, like yeah. they didn't give a damn what else he did. Brides had revisited. <laughs> who cares? They they want to hear it in all rooms in the house. Like I really want to talk about this important film, Paddington too, right? Dude, they were, and it was weird. I was like, okay, y'all stop. Like he's this is serious, and like wow. talking to him about, but that, that shows like. Like I said, this this podcast has been just like the Last Dragon, many tentacles <laughs> that we that, that we exposed here today. Um, Jack, as we close up shop here, we do want to let everybody know our email address is still functioning for a couple weeks until we do our last last goodbye episode. So we want to hear from y'all. RT is wrong at RottenTomatoes.com. Let's get a lot of fresh catch-up crew members saying, what was your favorite episode that we did? What was the movie that really spoke to you? Had you not seen a movie, then we talked about it, and then you're like, oh, maybe I should go check this out. Is The Last Dragon going to be that movie? Yeah. As, as just Jacqueline putting it in the book and having it on the show uh, was my initiation into the wild, wacky world of said dragon. So, Jacqueline, uh, we got one more of these. One more of these, and it's a, a good farewell. We're going to have a great time on the final farewell episode. I think we should both wear black. <laughs> like a funeral. Oh, wow. You want to wear... I, I don't... It's more of a celebration than that, though. I mean, but that's you know? what it is. It's the, called, called homecoming. It's it's like the last <laughs> night of our tour. It's, you know, okay, it's, it's, it's like we're wrapping tour. the tour before we go to Hawaii on okay. break. So. Okay, maybe maybe we'll wear... You can wear a hula skirt. Okay. All right. Don't don't ask me twice. I'll bring the <laughs> coconut boobs. I'll do the whole thing. Uh, don't tell me what a good time. That is Jacqueline Coley. You can find her podcast, the awards podcast, the awards yes. show, and it's going to be running pretty much through the rest of... Yeah, we'll Time? be we'll be there till the end of March, and then we take a little bit of a break over the summer, and then we get geared up for Emmy season when we come back in July. By then, the uh, tour will be in full swing. So my next stop is going to be in Boston, and then I got New York coming up. I got I Seattle. I got Vegas. I have uh, San Diego, Little Rock, Arkansas, New Orleans. There's a bunch of different places I'll be. So you can go to markellis.live for all those tour dates at Mark Ellis Live at that girl Jacqueline. And Brandon, you know, the social media is uh, Frodo underscore Blackens. That's right. Possibly the best handle. You know, the reason why social media is created for handles like that. Yes, yes it really yes. was. And I'm, I'm sad that we went away from that. <laughs> <laughs> for the whole gang here at Rotten Tomatoes, including producer Brian behind the scenes, uh, thank you guys for tuning in and watching us, listening us. However you decided to enjoy Rotten Tomatoes is wrong. 
We're really happy you did. And uh, we'll see you one more time. Until then, don't stop glowing, kids. <laughs>